Hi, welcome back to Buried. Oh my god, this is actually a really hard choice. So I shoot my friend's hand and make him mad at me. I mean, all right. Just think about this for a second. Living without a hand, not the worst thing to do. I know people that don't have hands. Being dead, kind of sucky. He made it this far. I don't think he's gonna die yet. Let's wait. <laughs> Dennis is fighting hard, doing everything he can to bring the gun around with his good hand. He's screaming as he tries to tear his hand away, screaming in both fury and desperation. This only seems to anger the creatures, which then swats Dennis with another one of its tentacles, opening a gash across his cheek. His skin peels back and his eyes go wide with shock. The creature drops into the ground, as if playing with him, and then the floor and space around Dennis seems to warp. The bottom quarter of his body seems to disappear before I realize it's being merged with the floor. And at that moment, I know, it's over. Three others sworn him, surrounding what remains of his fallen body. I don't even hear Dennis scream. There's just a frenzy of that crackling, sickening wail sound. After that, there's nothing else. Fury, sorrow, and absolute rage surge through my heart. I grab my gun and the remaining, as the remaining beasts come toward me. They'll kill me, but I don't care. This is war as far as I'm concerned. This is... Amy grabs me from behind and pulls me hard inside. I try fighting her off, but she's persistent, and part of my mind knows she's right. Don't be an idiot, she yells to me. She practically throws me through the doorway. As I fall, I hear her fire off two shots before slamming the door closed behind her. I watch blearily as she punches a few buttons on the control pad on the wall. This is followed by a metallic click as the door locks. We're safe in the chamber, but Dennis is gone. Well, I fucked up. I really... I really fucked up. I thought he would make it. I didn't think he was gonna die. I really thought, like, plot armor was gonna save him. I got too comfortable. I'm sorry, Dennis. We're now inside a large reinforced chamber of sorts, almost like the inside of a submarine. Near us is the floor shut near us is the door shut tight. Far away from us, along the back wall, are all sorts of controls and monitors. It seems clear that this metal door is impenetrable, at least to them. I'm fairly sure that they aren't getting in. Dennis, I say. I'm sorry, Amy says. And I'm sorry for pulling you back, but you were walking to your death out there. I know, I say, but that doesn't make it any easier. I couldn't quite see, but it looked like you may have had a shot. Why didn't you take it? Amy asked. I really thought he would get away. Oh my god, you know. <laughs> he told me not to shoot. Roger, Amy says. Oh my god, I'm sorry. I'm... He's dead, I say, hoping that speaking the words will help me to understand what just happened. I came through all of this to try to save him, and he's dead. How did this happen? Why did I listen to him? Out of nowhere, an image of Dennis pumping his fist after winning a game of pool pops into my head. I can't reconcile that happy image with what I just saw. I feel myself zoning out, wanting to just give up, but I'm stubborn, and the fact that Dennis is dead is a cruel motivator. I have to get out of here, I say. What I don't say is that I have to get out of here so that all of this trouble will have been worth something. We are interrupted by a man's voice booming behind us. Just what in the hell do you think you're doing? The man roars. He's an older man who seems to exude power and authority, but he also looks tired and scared. I assume this is Barksdale. He walks over to us in the back recess of the chamber. We didn't have a choice, Amy responds. We had to... Did you override the locks on the hangar doors? Barksdale demands. Yes, I did, but we had to. Do you have any idea what you could have done? Amy doesn't answer right away. She's furious, but she's also scared and visibly exhausted. I'll break the tension. Who's this? I address my question to Amy, preferring to get my info from her rather than whoever this is. The man doesn't break eye contact with Amy. Colonel Barksdale, he runs the place, she says, annoyed. Look, Barksdale, she says, 
You can berate me and lecture me all you want when this is over, but right now, I have a wounded civilian here, and as you can see, several entities trying to get into this room. So if you could actually do something instead of sitting on your throne and yelling at me, that would be great. I'm impressed by your guts and wonder if there's some sort of beef between the two of them. Surely working in a place like this would cause some stress and tension between people. As we wait, I notice a small peephole in the door. I go to it and look out at things. They're still looking for a way in, but finding no success. I wonder if they can sense or somehow see me through the door. <laughs> uh, do nothing, I'm really- they're not gonna know what flipping the bird means anyway, I would assume. I still don't understand what these things are capable of, and trying to figure out makes my head hurt. So I decide to leave them be. You'll be reprimanded for speaking to me in such a way, Barksdale says to Amy. Reprimand me all you want. I'd like to survive this first. Cover your ears, Barkdale shouts, walking away toward the far end of the room. Stay put until you hear back from me. Thank you, Amy says with fire in her words. She then turns to me and says, better do what the man says. I'm not asking. I clamp my hands over my ears just in time to protect my hearing from a deafening blast. I can still feel my blood rushing out and wonder if this is what Dennis felt like as the big felt like at the beginning of his end. Before the sorrow of losing Dennis can consume me, something slaps against the wall of the room with a tremendous force. I assume this is just another of the monsters, slithering along at the wall. When I turn back to the door, I hear something surprising. More bursts of a loud explosive noise start ringing out. Looking through the peephole again, I see the core of one of the beasts explode. It vanishes in a puff of smoke and clear liquid. Looking to my left, I see Barksdale in a shooting stance at the far end of the room. He's firing through a small slit in the wall. He's using some high-powered weapon, the likes of which I've never seen. I see a slight movement as the gun kicks, accompanied by a flicker of white light. Immediately, another monster is downed, its tentacles filling around aimlessly as most of its core is torn through. I instantly feel gratitude and an immense satisfaction in knowing that they are being picked off in such a way. Uh, let's keep watch- keep watching. I slide my eye up to the peephole again, to watch what affects the shot- I slide my eye up to the peephole again, to watch what effects the shots are having outside. Before I know that white liquid and gas is- Because I know that the white liquid and gas is the creature's blood, seeing it draws up a frenzied bloodlust in me. Another is blasted in the center, the translucent shell collapsing inwards as its light dies out. Yet another is shot in a mass of floating tentacles, causing its body to, dis to disappear as it dips in and out of existence. After several moments, my view is blocked by a splatter of white liquid that covers my, that covers my peephole. <laughs> when the firing is over, I barely even notice it. Soon after, Barksdale walks back to our side of the room. They're all gone, Barksdale says, and I've resealed the hangar doors. How'd you kill them like that? I ask. Classified weapons that, quite frankly, you have no business being near. Amy gets to her feet and returns to the panel on the wall. Thanks. How badly is the civilian hurt? Barksdale asks Amy, as if I'm not good enough for him to speak to. A nasty cut, Amy answers. If he gets some quick attention, he'll be okay. Okay, I... Okay, I'll have Strikeland get me a med kit. Strikeland survived? Amy asks, sounding cheerful. Yes, and until you and your friend showed up, I thought we were the only ones. Hang tight, she's on her way. With that said, he retreats away to the back of the room, as if he can't stand to be around us. Amy approaches me and looks over. You're in good hands. Strickland will be able to sh You're in good hands. Strickland will be able to fix you up. Is she a doctor or something? Sort of. She's also a physicist. But, oddly enough, she spends her time as a trauma nurse in the army. Is Strickland a friend of yours? I ask. Amy chuckles. Yeah, we've known each other for a while. The only woman in a sea of overachieving men. Barksdale sounds like a prick. You must be glad Strickland survived. Barksdale sounds like a prick. That's because he is, Amy says. But he runs this place, so he sort of has the right... Yeah, Washington are a faculty. 
Washington are a facility buried under the woods of Kentucky. Gender rules stay the same, she says, rolling her eyes. Within a few seconds, the door opens behind. The door behind us opens, and a woman appears from back further in the chamber. She enters the room with what looks like a small suitcase. She's dressed up in a very basic and drab military getup, complete with a holstered sidearm. My name is Connie Strickland, she says, getting straight to the point. I can patch you up pretty good, but it's gonna hurt. I nod, honestly not caring how much it hurts. My god, I just want to get out of here, to get home. Sit down and let's see if we can get your shirt off, Strickland says. I sit down slowly and start unbuttoning my shirt. She has to help me slip off my shoulders, but we manage. How bad is it? I ask. Bad, she says. It almost looks like a burn, but I've seen much worse. I might as well talk to Strickland, if only to distract me from the pain. What's your story? You're a scientist too? I'd be like, you're a scientist too, that's cool. Strickland rolls her eyes as she gathers a needle and some thread. I was always into fringe science. I started in labs where these eccentric Russian scientists were being funded by the US to work on combining DNA types. I sort of became obsessed with perfecting human physiology while I was a trauma nurse in the army. You were a mad scientist then, I say. I get that a lot, but no, not compared to the stuff we do here. What kind of stuff? It's complicated. Comer masses, quantum gravity, crunching things down into their switch tile radiuses, fun stuff. Yeah, mad scientist, I say, trying to keep myself calm with dry humor. There are lots of small labs working on the same stuff, she argues. They just don't have our funding. When you guys ran in here, when you guys ran in here, she says, I was horrified. Those barrels outside? I'm not sure if you saw them. Well, if you shot them, it could have been bad. Why? I ask. The gray ones are filled with an experimental fuel that's highly flammable. The yellow ones contain liquid nitrogen. What? Just laying around? Well, this area is the safest in the building. The most secure. Well, it used to be anyway. And take this, she says, handing me four pills. Painkillers. They won't work immediately, but they'll dull the worst of what you're feeling. Are these the best idea? I ask. Won't these make me feel dizzy or out of sorts or something? All I get in response is an annoyed and determined look. Bruh, is liquid nitrogen flammable? I thought nitrogen was like the safest chemical ever because it doesn't react with anything because it loves itself too much. I'm so confused. I'm sorry. I love chemistry. I'm confused. Uh, fuck it. Take the drugs. Shit, I said don't. No. <laughs> really, I say. I don't want to get lightheaded in case we have to move fast. I can handle it. Your call, Strickland says as she starts working on me. She slathers the wound with some sort of liquid that stings like crazy and I gasp. You decided not to take him. You take it like a man. Ready to stab me yet? Ready to stab me yet? Strickland asks. I'm fine, I hiss. I wince as she dabs at my eye, swollen from where Marcus kicked me. I grip my teeth in pain and try to catch my breath. The anticipation is the worst part. I'm relieved to find it doesn't hurt as much as I feared. It's no picnic for sure, but compared to the fire-like pain in my wound, it's bearable. So you and Barkstow are the only survivors? Amy asks. It seems that way. Those that didn't disappear into thin air were killed by those things. Strickland says, nodding to the secured door. How many were killed? I'm guessing 30 or so, Strickland says. I'm not sure how many were scheduled to come in today. I'm glad to see you. Where were you when it happened? Amy asks. I was in the micro lab on level two, Strickland replies. Park and O'Brien were there with me, and they just disappeared, I guess. It looked like they were being stretched, disordered. Then, there was a ball of white light, and they were gone. The ball of white light just annihilated everything it touched. Would it leave a perfectly round hole? I ask, the light bulb turning on in my head. We saw some of those up at the logging site. That was probably the same phenomenon, Strickland replies. Amy looks like a child afraid to ask an adult for something. Finally, she asks, 
Where did they go? We don't know, Strickland says. It could be an infinite number of different dimensions, or even some dimensions that merge and mix together. It could also be a place that exists between dimensions. Barksdale calls it the void. I'd call it dead. It's not dead, though. I mean, there could be alive. You don't know. How is that possible? We don't know that just yet, Strickland says. Our understanding of space-time is evolving. Especially when you start warping it like we've been doing, Amy adds. That point seems to be the end of the conversation, as both women fall quiet. I wince through the rest of Strickland's stitching, feeling the tug of my skin, but thankfully, no more flowing blood. Finally, Strickland says, you're good to go. I slide my shirt back on, aware of the thick pad of gauze that Strickland applied to my shoulder. So have you and Barksdale been able to contain all of those creatures? Amy asks. Strickland appears shocked, clearly not the reaction Amy was expecting. Contain? Are you nuts? Do you not know what's happening? Amy's eyes widen in fearful confusion. What do you mean, what's happening, other than the initial experiment failure? The anomalies are becoming more numerous and further from the source, Strickland says. The casual humor in her voice is now gone. These questions are so dumb. <laughs> I'm sorry, I shouldn't be roasting the questions. What anomalies? The doorways, she says. The pockets of exotic matter and negative energy that are letting those things in. The failed experiment caused the first one, but it set off a chain reaction. They're gaining momentum along geodesics emanating from the facility. What the hell does that mean, I ask? It means, Amy chimes in, that those doorways and monsters are starting to appear all over the facility. Maybe even the surface. Not yet, luckily, Strickland says. But the doorways will start appearing on the surface, and it won't stop there. The anomaly's reach could extend infinitely as far as we know. Those entities will appear on the surface. In other states, other countries. Holy shit, I say. You mean the world is going to be overrun? The horrors of the past few hours have made me ready to believe anything. But this is almost too much. <sighs> Unfortunately, yes, Strickland says. My god, Amy says, stepping away. Isn't there anything we can do? There is a last resort, Strickland says, her eyes darting over to Barksdale at the back of the room. There's an emergency failsafe switch. What? Amy says. I've never heard of that. Where? You weren't cleared for it, Strickland replies. And that switch, Amy says, is a way to stop this? Yes, Strickland says, seeming uneasy with the conversation. What does it do? The switches are eraser, she says. It destroys the entire facility and terminates any systems or experiments that are being conducted. It's also an emergency shutdown for interdimensional travel. It puts an event horizon around the facility. What the hell is that? I ask, incredulous. It's the perimeter of a black hole, she replies. The boundaries inside which nothing can escape. Not even light. But there's two problems with hitting the switch. So the first problem is we'd all be killed, sucked into a black hole before we'd have the time to evacuate. The second reason, Strickland whispers, suddenly quiet, is that Barksdale won't allow it. What? Amy gasps. Why not? He wants to allow those, those things to flood the surface. Thousands, millions will die. Strickland puts her hands up, silencing Amy. They both peer over to the far side of the room, where Barksdale has his back turned. I know, I know. He doesn't- he says he doesn't care. He says he'll be happy to be rid of the oversight, so he can continue his work. The oversight? Amy almost screams, regaining control over her voice when Strickland gives her another look of warning. You mean our government? I ask. He's aware that this could disrupt, even topple our government, and he doesn't care? Strickland sighs. Barksdale is- well, he's off the range right now. He's gone rogue, and he's armed. This comment makes me look toward the shotgun I brought in with me. I'd nearly forgotten it in the last few moments. When Barksdale has his back turned to us, I take it in my hands and slide it beneath me. Just in time, too, as Barksdale, walk Barksdale walks over from the back of the room to our side of the chamber. He gives Strickland a suspicious look before speaking to her. Is the civilian going to survive? He asks. 
Yes, he's stitched up and good to go, Strickland replies. That's great news, Barksdale says. I'm sitting right here, I say sarcastically. You can actually speak to me, you know. Amy, it's quite nice to see you have survived, he says. Were there any others? The aloof way this asshole is talking is getting under my skin. A guy named Marcus that works on the first level, from IT, Amy says. That's all I know for sure. Marcus Papscott, Barksdale says. Where is he? We're not sure, I say. He was separated from us. Oh, Barksdale replies, clearly taken aback by my stern reply. That's unfortunate. Barksdale seems to think about something, then looks directly at me. You're with the logging crew, aren't you? Remind me, how did you get in here again? We were trying to get away from here. We were. True statement. Ah, right. We lost our primary power source when the experiment failed, Barksdale says. The experiment failure created those exotic matter pockets, that hole you fell into. And if there were enough of them, it may have opened a way into our facility. Depending on the power sources that were damaged, Barktail continues, it could have also shut down the locking systems before backups kicked in. Everything is starting to make sense now. From the start, it had seemed peculiar that we'd be so that we'd be so easily able to walk into a place like this. I'm going for it. Where's the rest of our crew? Your crew? Bark still asks. Frank and Joe? They're gone. Gone? Gone where? I ask, my voice trembling. Hearing him speak the names of my crew enrages me. They were annihilated by antimatter pockets created during the failure. A bright ball of light. In the aftermath, all you would see is a round hole in the ground. Boxdale says this like he's sharing yesterday's sports scores. I let my face crumble into my hands. I had, suspect I had suspected all of I had suspected this. All this time, they were already dead. So what caused the experiment to fail? Your crew hit one of our main power lines. We aren't sure exactly how, but we know that's what did it. You're trying to blame all this on me? I roar. The timing was... unfortunate, Barksdale says. So, Amy asks, what do we do now? Now it's time to continue our work, Barksdale says calmly, turning away to the instruments on the near wall. I'm not starting shit, I'm staying quiet. The guy sounds like a complete lunatic, but he's a lunatic that's accustomed to power and armed with some type of advanced weaponry. So I keep my intentions unspoken, assuming Barksdale is used to going unchallenged by people he considers beneath him. He certainly seems like that type. I want to continue my work, Barksdale muses. Other researchers will eventually discover what we have, sure. But I want it to be me. This is my laboratory, these are my experiments. The work I've led here will earn me my place in history. And quite frankly, I don't need to explain it to you. Up on the surface, they'll struggle to defend themselves, since they won't know what they're dealing with. I have the necessary weapons. After a few months, who knows? Maybe I'll decide the world is ready for me to help them, and we'll go from there. He turns his back to us as he says this, walking to the far side of the chamber, like we're some kind of distraction. Amy takes this opportunity to whisper to us. We need to hit that switch. It's the only option. What he's saying is murder, treason, genocide. She looks over to Strickland for support, traveling off. But Strickland looks at the ground, clearly torn. She won't look anyone in the eye and makes an effort not to look at Barksdale. He seems distracted with whatever instruments he's studying on the far side of the room. At the moment I realize my body... At this moment, I realize my body feels like a bomb went off inside of it. Maybe those painkillers wouldn't have been so bad. Strickland finally whispers a response. Even if we s even if we decided that we want to hit that switch, Barksdale won't allow us. To hell with him. Amy agrees. Where is the switch located? She asks. There's an elevator out in the hangar, Strickland says. Take it to the basement. The switch is at the end of a long tunnel. You. But Strickland never finishes. Two things happen at once as she speaks, her mouth stopping mid-sentence. First, a loud booming rings out, and the top of her head seems to explode. Amy screams in surprise, and I jump back in shock as Strickland's body collapses beside me. 
behind her fallen body, Barksdale is holding his experimental rifle, and now he's pointing it at us. I wonder if Barksdale is even crazier than Marcus. He just shot a woman that worked for him to keep her quiet. Surely he won't have an issue with killing me. Now, Barksdale yells. No more whispering. No secrets. You two will stay in here. And get away from that door. If anyone whispers one more thing, I'll blow your heads off. My mind is racing to figure out a way to get through the secured door and into the hangar. Beyond that, of course, there was a fail-safe switch. I don't know. <laughs> you smell like dog. With no other ideas, I resort to something I know will do well. Be noisy. You moron, I say. For someone in such a position of power, you think like an idiot. Kill me. Go ahead. But then you better get someone out into those woods to move my equipment. You really want the police snooping around a wrecked logging site for missing loggers? As if someone as dumb as me found my- if someone as dumb as me found my way into your little hideout. My rant is having its attendant effect. Barksdale's teeth clench and rage fills his eyes. You're a fool, he shouts. You don't have the slightest idea how difficult the work we do here is. How advanced and world-changing. Keep him talking. You're scientists thing. You're so smart, I interrupt. But you have no common sense. All the knowledge in the world is useless if you have no moral compass. Barksdale is starting to lose control. His breathing intensifies. If you think for one moment that you could do... As quickly as I can, I raise my gun and fire. I don't even take aim, I just fire in Barksdale's general direction. Barksdale takes off running, and my shot misses wide. He runs for cover to the back of the room. That's all we need. Amy also fires a shot to keep him under cover as we head for the door. Amy pushes a button and the door swings open. Barksdale will be on us in a second, so we dash out of the hangar, ready to defend ourselves. Amy and I run as fast as we can through the rows of barrels. Barksdale comes charging out of the chamber almost immediately. As he steps onto the hangar floor, he starts shooting. Each shot sends a jolt of fear through me as I wait for a bullet to end my life. We need to get to the elevator on the far side of the room, Amy tells me. It leads down below to the switch. I mean, I've been running away from fights so far, but um, this is a person that we can actually kill. We both lean out from up <laughs> Sorry. We both lean out from the cover of the barrels and take several shots at Barksdale. He steps back into the isolation chamber, which gives me a sense of victory. But then I realize he may just be reloading whatever high powered weapon he has. We need to move, I say. Agreed, Amy says. We both take off at full sprint for the other side of the hangar. Somehow I make it through the row of barrels and head to the elevator's entrance. I turn back to allow Amy to enter first, but she isn't there. I look back to the barrels and see she's fallen about halfway down. She doesn't appear to be hurt, but she's paralyzed with fear, sitting motionlessly as Barkdale peppers the area with gunfire. Ugh, run and give her cover, you know. I start to step out into the open to head back for Amy, but Barksdale's gunfire pins me pins me back into the elevator entrance with a loud bang. Apparently, he's reloading that weapon of his. As the sparks fly inches from my face, I realize I have to help her from here. I then re remember the contents of the barrels. One color has highly flammable fuel, the other contains liquid nitrogen. I'm no scientist, but I'm pretty sure liquid nitrogen is mostly harmless unless you have direct contact. He's smart. If one of those barrels gets shot and the liquid nitrogen spills out, I'm fairly positive it will simply evaporate, but it could choke him. That could create a cover of sorts for Amy, like a smoke cloud. Ugh, hell, but which of the barrels holds liquid nitrogen? Strickland told us, but I can't remember. I have to remember quickly or Barksdale is going to get careless with the shooting and we could all die. This is why we properly label all lab equipment. Every single barrel should say liquid nitrogen. I'm guessing the other thing is NF3, which is literally just like 
liquid flames. You should look into it. It's really cool. Um, what the fuck is it called? Like nitrogen fluoride. It's like the most the combustible substance known to man. Um, anyway, I'm pretty sure it's the yellow barrels. Um, but here's the thing about liquid nitrogen, right? I'm going on a rant and you can't stop me. All right. So it seems harmless, but if there was enough and it replaced all of the air in the room, which it could, they would both suffocate because there's too much nitrogen and not enough oxygen. Which is why it's really important when you're working with liquid nitrogen to be careful. Anyway, the nitrogen I'm pretty sure is in the yellow barrels, but watch me be wrong. <laughs> The yellow barrels. I'm fairly certain those have the liquid nitrogen in them. Without giving myself a single moment to second-guess myself, I aim at one and pull the trigger. There's a pinging noise, followed by a hiss. A stream of liquid nitrogen spills out and begins to evaporate immediately. Amy looks around for a moment, clearly baffled, but then figures out what I've done. She hits the ground right away and for a moment, I lose sight of her in the cloud of mist. Behind us, Barksdale starts to fire, apparently not caring if he happens to hit the barrels with fuel in it. Moments later, I see Amy's shape emerge from the mist. There's a terrifying second where she's out of the mist and in, in the exposed space between the barrels and the protection offered by the elevator's interior. Barksdale gets off two shots, but the nitrogen mist has obscured his vision too much for him to get proper aim. However, one of them nicks Amy's leg, sending her tumbling just before she reaches the entryway to the elevator. I dash out, lift her up, and we both hobble over to the elevator behind the cover of the mist. Thanks. Thank God he remembered which barrel was which, she says. I reach out to press the call button on the elevator. We both step inside and close the doors. It's a service elevator, made of wood and metal, like something from a coal mine. We step inside and the doors close. The motors on the elevator sound like dying dogs. As the elevator slides down, the lights and the flames give way to complete blackness. I lose track of how long the elevator descends. It's hard to tell to the, due to the lack of lighting, but it must go down another 500 feet underground. The elevator comes to a stop with a shuddering clang and I waste no time exiting. A tunnel stretches out with sparse white bulbs lighting the way. Most of the wall is made of raw earth and rock, but there are boards and concrete slathered in areas used to reinforce the tunnel. I see a warning sign posted on the wall. I want to read it, but there's not much time. I'm reading it. Warning. Authorized personnel only beyond this point. Trespassers will be pressed. I don't care. I literally do not care. Damn it, I just wasted time. Well, glad we got that out of the way, now that everyone is dead. After only a few steps, the pain in my body intensifies. How stupid was I to turn down those painkillers? I don't know, right from left. I look up, and when I see the tunnel ceiling- <coughs> <coughs> Sorry. I look up and when I see the tunnel ceiling is less than six inches over my head, claustrophobia freezes me for a moment. The ceiling is not high at all and there's barely enough room for Amy and I to walk side by side. Which is for the best because her leg is clearly causing her a great deal of pain. She's soaked in blood and hobbling along. I don't think I can go any further, she says, wincing but trying to keep her composure. Sit down, I tell her. I'll be back. There's no sense in- <coughs> There's no sense in chancing further injury to your leg. She nods and I help her down. She shudders in pain as she eases into sitting position on the floor. Thanks, she says. According to Strickland, the switch should be at the end of this hall. I look and when I see the tunnel ceiling is less than six inches over my head, claustrophobia freezes me for a moment. Still, it's much better than facing the monsters above me. I wonder then, walking through the darkness, where they came from. Is the portal still open? I hold the gun in one hand and feel my way along the hall with the wall with another. The wall under my palm anchors me to reality, to sanity. I am not in some boundless abyss, but still in the real world. For a little while longer, at least. I recognize that I'm marching to my end. As much as I wish I weren't, it's not surprising. From the moment I saw what those creatures could do to time and space, at least a part of me knew that death was inevitable. Before I had time to wonder whether my family would really miss me, I see a light ahead. 
It's nothing more than a speck of blue light, but in the darkness of the tunnel, it's like a lighthouse on a stormy sea. I slog forward, my eyes straining to focus on that little light ahead. From somewhere ahead, I start hearing something that sounds like water. It's trickling lately, like a leaking faucet. And behind me, and behind that, it's, so it's something that sounds like wind, a light breeze through an open field, and a voice. Anywhere else, the sounds would have been pleasant, but here in the blackness of the tunnel, they're menacing. We're sneaking up on the might, chancing this shit right now. I don't make a sound, instead trying to make sense of what's going on around me. I cock my head, trying to concentrate, and then I realize that I can see the tunnel walls now. This is odd, as I wasn't able to see them a few seconds ago. This is different from the blue light at the end of the tunnel. It's then that I see the slight shimmering in the air. It looks like a foggy mirror steamed over after a shower. And it's moving, dancing in the air like some abstract firefly. It's not menacing like the creatures, so that threat is null. It's peaceful, serene. I watch as the shimmer branches out and becomes two, then three, then four. They snake out in different directions, tracing the tunnel walls. Are these shimmers the doors to another dimension Strickland was talking about? Suddenly I'm surrounded by light and below me and realize there's no avoiding it. The question is, how am I going- Oh, light above and below me and realize there's no avoiding it. The question is, how am I going to go through? How the hell are you gonna go in feet first? Bitch head. First. I stick my head through the- through and feel a tingling sensation. Almost pleasant. I reach out slowly, my hand stretching out to one of those shimmers of what I can only assume are some kind of light. They're hypnotizing, so much so that I don't even realize that the walls of the tunnel are vanishing. I feel something like wind and a brief electrical pulse pass through me as the lights take me. Then there's a very, there's then a very gentle pushing sensation and I somehow know that I'm being expelled. I've passed through something. Maybe the lights. Maybe the tunnel walls. I don't know. But the shimmering lights fade a bit, still dancing in the air but no longer large and branching out. As my eyes adjust, I see right away that I am no longer standing in that dark tunnel far beneath the hangar. I have no idea where I am. I'm just somewhere else. And I'm terrified. Am I on fucking Mars? Where is this? Oh my god. It's kind of pretty. The ground I land on looks like hot coals. There are dips and many cliffs breaking the landscape ahead of me. There's a wash of orange and blue overhead in the sky that makes no sense. It's both beautiful and terrifying at once. A scattering of stars hang overhead and they all seem to be breathing, pulsing with a gentle energy, as if alive. I can't tell if there are clouds in the sky because of everything about it, from the colors to the trembling horizon line, seem to be amorphous. Everything is knitted together, living. I stare a moment longer and I swear I feel the sky breathing. For off to my right, I see what looks to be a plume of fire small yet bright, with no source of fuel. It looks as if the ground itself is creating the flame. Several more of these flames dot the landscape further out. The air is thick and muggy. Then I realize something horrible. I don't know if what I'm breathing here resembles air at all. In a place like this, one of the impossible beauty, one of impossible beauty but also very stark horror, my mind just doesn't know what to do. A wave of nausea comes over me and I think I might be sick. I'm not sure if it would be better to fight it or give in. The white light has brought me here is nowhere to be found. Is there anyone in here? Is there any way to escape? Uh, yell out. I don't know. I take a deep breath of whatever otherworldly gas is filling this place and belt out as loud as I can. Hello? Hello? Is there anyone else here? Anyone? I hear a voice in response. It's faint. Distant. I turn and hear it coming out of one of the massive crevices along the ground. Inside that crack, about ten feet down, a very pale man lies on the ledge. He is human, but looks close to death. He is in the center of a large pool of blood, and his left leg has been twisted and torn in an unnatural way. As I walk to the ledge, he looks up and sees me. Help me, please, the man says. His eyes are wide, although everything about him speaks of weakness. He's close to death, or insanity, or both. Who are you? I'm Dr. Connor. He strains to get out. I work in the facility. Please help. 
I want to know more, but it seems cruel to steal what looks like the last of his breaths just to answer my questions. I'd love to, I respond, but I don't know where the hell I am or how to get back home. The light, he says. It's a doorway. It might take you back to the facility. Where did it go? They come. C come and go. They'll be back. Now please, help me. I desperately want to help, but there's no way I can reach him. His ledge is too far away, above the pools of fire. I don't think I can get to you, he says. No, that's not what I mean, he replies. His eyes are on the shotgun that I almost forgot I was still holding. I realize what he wants and I shake my head. I can't, I say. I can't do that. Please, he pleads. Those things. They have the others that came here with me. I got dropped along the way. They'll, they'll be back. They'll be back and they'll kill me that... He says, again, indicating the gun. It'll be quicker. Less painful. I can't, I repeat. Please, look at my damn leg. I'm dead anyway. I'm about to refuse him again when I hear an all-too-familiar static sound from another crevice behind him. I hear another one of those shrill noises, and the watch as one of the monsters materializes up out of the neighboring crevice. Two more come out after it, then a third, then five, then ten. Soon I lose count. Soon I lose count as what was just a few turns into a flood. And then suddenly I understand the man's reasoning. A bullet would be mercy. I check the gun and see that I have only run round left. I can use it on this guy, but I may need it for myself later. From beside me, the man pleads again. My god, he says, a waver of lunacy in his voice. Please. This is probably the unpopular opinion, but I'm gonna shoot him. I look back to the man and wince. I know it's the right thing to do, but my finger resists. With a roar of disgust, I level the gun toward his head, turn my eyes away, and then pull the trigger. Your aim is true. The man crumples lifelessly to the ground. And that's when I see the shimmers wavering to my right, the direction I originally came from. I look back to the monsters and see that they've now noticed me. Some of them begin floating up the walls of the crevice. They are less than ten feet separating us. The shimmers of white light are within arm's reach, its movements reminding me of fish in an aquarium. I reach out and feel myself accepted by them again. <coughs> I feel the sensation of wind and wait for the feeling of being pushed out back to the tunnel in the facility. But it doesn't come this time. This time I feel something else. I feel a tugging sensation that seems to want to drag me in all directions at once. And the world, as the world goes dark, I realize that I'm somewhere else. It is not the darkness of a tunnel. This is the darkness of a total void. There is darkness around me, everywhere. Nothingness. I feel nothing under my feet, nothing to my sides. I can't touch or sense anything at all. I don't even know which way is up or down. It's as though I am all that exists. And as I remain there, I just hear silence, not even the sound of my heartbeat. The blackness is so deep that I feel I can't distinguish between my thoughts and what is real. I hear screaming, but I can't tell if it's someone else or my mind screaming to fill this void. I chose to cry out. I hear my own shout in my head, but it doesn't seem to travel out into the abyss. It bounces in my head endlessly, like an echo down a long, ancient corridor. I assume this is the place that Strickland referred to, the place between dimensions. This darkness could consume me if it wanted to. I try to will myself out of it, to have those shimmering lights spit me out, but it isn't happening. At this point, my mind starts to hallucinate, or at least I think it does. Are they visions? My mind playing tricks on me? I can't tell. All I can do is watch. I see the logging site, and Tony's leg still pinned under the dozer. I feel a- I feel a pang of regret that I have left in such a- I feel a pang of regret that I left him in such a state. I see myself talking to Dennis, 
and Tim blowing up at me for not telling him that Tony was gone. Then the scene rearranges himself, itself, and I'm standing between Dennis and Marcus's gun. It changes again and the shape of Marcus lies on the ground, still held in on revenge, even after I let him live. In my mind, I'm sobbing as I watch Dennis get torn apart by those monsters all over again, and I just stood by and watched. And I'm calm a bit as I watch myself shoot the right barrel and help Amy to safety. And just when I feel I can't take any more of this, I see the man in that strange world, begging for death. I watch as I take his life just before those beasts reach him. All of these things flooding my mind, and it feels like my brain is vomiting. Yet, in the midst of all of this, I see what's really important. The switch. In my mind's eye, I see that glowing light in the tunnel. The one far ahead. Small and distant. I'm a focus on it. I focus my mind on the tunnel and the image of that flickering light. With a mental effort so strong that it is nearly a physical motion, I make myself envision that little light in the end of the tunnel as if it were right in front of me. With that, I feel the wind again, a light breeze that seems to come from everywhere. And then, with a relief that I can only imagine feels like death, I move forward. Yay, we made it back to the tunnel. <laughs> I've ejected from the void and am suddenly standing in the tunnel again. I let out a wail of triumph that turns into a bout of weeping. The weeping only intensifies when I see that light up ahead, a flickering blue light. Somewhere behind me, I hear a crackling noise. <coughs> I think of Amy down that way, by the elevator. Have they reached her? There's no way I can find out. For now I have to keep on with my plan. Besides, if it works, we're all gone anyway. I feel like I can listen to get a better read on where they are, or I can just make a break for it. Bro, I'm running. I don't even bother looking back. There's no time. Instead, I run with all my might straight ahead, my focus on that little blue light ahead of me. As I run, I see a different light. A white one, flickering my peripheral vision. It's another one of those shimmers that goes into other worlds, and seems like they're appearing and disappearing with more frequency now. Strickland was right. These things could reach the surface soon, unleashing more monsters. This whole thought makes me refocus on the blue light, the man-made light, the switch. The blue light gets closer, and as it does, I can make out a square shape around it. This has to be it. The familiar static scream of the monsters is much closer now. I have to be quick. I grip the gun tightly, regretting my decision to use the last bullet on the man in the other world. Looks like I'll be using this for as, as a bludgeon. I run ahead into the darkness, my eyes locked on the switch that I assume is going to kill not only the creatures, but myself as well. As I approach, I see the lever. It's covered by a glass box that I will need to break. The blue light is directly beneath this, highlighting a series of tubes and wires that snake into the inner workings of the device. In the middle is blackness, not like a darkly colored part of the machine, but a hole in reality. It looks like some sort of illusion. All the while I hear the static of creatures coming up dangerously close now. I have no idea how much time I'll have. It's not like I can shoot them, so I'm just going to smash the glass and flip the switch. I draw back the stock of the gun and smash through the glass box that houses the lever. The glass shattering is like music to my ears. I reach out for the lever, my hand grasping it. Without warning, I feel immense pain course through my body. It feels like the fire racing down my back, causing me to fall to one knee in agony. There's only one of them that I can see. It blasts horrific static noise at me and I ready my gun. With no bullets left, I get ready to use it as a club. I try to strike. The monster bats the gun away, warping it into an S-shape, and then follows up by swinging its appendage at me. The sting of its touch forces me back against the side of the cavern, my face striking the wall hard. My jaw crunches and I feel a sharp pain encompass my head. Then the creature is upon me again. Its tentacles melt into me and I scream. I can't help it. I sound like a wild animal. I keep trying to fend them off. I can keep trying to fend them off, or I can go for broke and just focus on the lever. Creatures be damned. Bro, I'm going for the lever. We're gonna flip it. We're gonna cause a black hole and we're gonna kill everyone. I put all my strength into my legs. The moment the monster in front of me draws back its eel-like arms to grab me, I pivot backward. 
My back strikes the machine, sending agony rocking through my body. I'm so thankful I broke the glass before this moment, before the coming violence. I stretch out and grab the lever. With one last desperate scream that shreds my voice, I jam it down. The tunnel is suddenly filled with a flash of intense darkness. It expands from the switch, swallowing the matter around it. At first, I'm sure this is the end of me. I expect this darkness to consume me, followed by death. But then another shimmer of dancing white light appears next to me. There are more of those streams of light, rips in space that, like this one that previously sent me to another ungodly world in the void. With nothing else to do but die, I try to escape into the shiver. When that stream of light envelops me, the expanding darkness of the switch is gone, and I feel a huge push. We're in a whole universe now, Jesus. My body feels stretched, collapsing, like I'm falling in all directions at once. The world goes white, and then there are pinpoints of stars everywhere. One of them breezes directly by my right, and I see something that looks like a spiral galaxy distorted in its folds. To my right, I see an endless stretch of stars and gas clouds, forming some glass galactic architecture. But beyond the immeasurable beauty, I notice something. I'm seeing the same star patterns over and over. They're repeating like reflections in an endless mirror. Are these different versions of the same galaxies? The same realities? To my left, I see a calm blue world and can barely make out trees. Familiar Kentucky trees that I've been around the last few weeks. To my right, I see a copy, an orange world, and all the trees are there as well. But something seems strange, disturbing. As I zoom by, I'm not sure how much control I have in this unusual place, but if I can direct myself, it's worth trying. Let's go to the blue world. I do decide to head to the blue world. I try to focus my mind on heading toward the blue world, not knowing what to expect. My breath escapes me for a moment. Everything is dark and peaceful, and nothing hurts. I really hope y'all can hear me. I'm like dying over here. Do not tell me that this shit is looping. I will scream. With breath back inside my body, I gasp and open my eyes. I'm back. Back at the logging site. How? I'm not sure. Did the shimmers react with the implosion of the switch? Some other accident? I have no idea. I sit up right away and become instantly dizzy. Amy, I say. There's no reason to think she survived whatever happened in that tunnel, but there's some sort of certainty that gets me to my feet. I wonder if I am somehow back in time, before we found the facility. What happens next makes me realize that can't be true. As I start walking forward, I feel a tremor in the ground. Somewhere off in the distance, I hear a metallic groan. That buried facility. It's being ripped apart under the ground by the activation of the switch. Trees are splintering and falling to the east, and I can see them topple over like dominoes. There's no way Barksdale and Marcus survived. Good riddance. I start to walk away in the opposite direction of the falling trees, but then I hear a scream. A woman's scream. I turn back and see a stumbling figure come out of the forest. It's Amy, and she looks like a ghost. How is she here? Did she fall into one of the shimmers as well? I decide I don't care and run to her. I throw my arms around her arm. I throw my arm under her armpit to hook her to me as we head to the logging site. You okay? I ask. Amy can only nod through her tears. I look to the area where the fa facility tore the woods apart and see a large plume of smoke rising up into the air. We've made it out of the facility alive, and that, I suppose, is the most important thing. It's then that I look up and notice the sky. Jesus. Huh. <sighs> Hey, it's daytime. The sky is beautiful and familiar, unobstructed by the trees that have been standing several minutes ago. I exhale and let my body start to relax. It's finally over. I'm not sure how long it will take me to get back to some semblance of a life, but I know one thing for sure. Any day above ground is going to be a good day. The end? I thought this was five chapters. I'm so confused. Is there like 
Tough it out. You and 64% of players didn't take the painkillers. Who survives? Yay, we kept Amy alive. Uh, we, we killed the man. Did I, like, accidentally, like, go through chapters 4 and 5? I do not remember. Alright, we chose to go home. I guess we can choose to not go home? Is that actually, like, the end? I'm so confused. Or is this, like, a prologue? I, I, there's five- I'm so confused, hold up. Am I dumb? Am I actually just dumb? Yeah, five chapters. Well, I guess there was no fifth chapter. Um, damn. Kind of makes it hard to do a live stream. Damn. Well, I hope y'all enjoyed. Um, I hope y'all had fun. I sure did. This was a cool series to do. I actually have another game lined up thanks to a friend that got it for me. Uh, for, like, next week. Uh, if you did enjoy, like, comment, subscribe? Possibly. I'm still a little confused, but I'm probably just dumb. Probably. There's a good chance I'm just dumb. Uh, yeah, I hope y'all are having a good time. Bye!